Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Today, it's our last episode in our series on Huey P. Long. Episode 6, A Long Shot? Last episode, we looked at Huey Long's dramatic entrance into the United States Senate. It's fair to say that he treated his new office with the contempt that you might have if you planned to vacate it in pretty short order. We all remember his promise. First public office, then the governorship, then the senate, and then the presidency. His lunatic propositions to share our wealth, which were being endlessly voted down. His flamboyant filibustering. Well, it might have made him an annoyance or even a joke to his fellow senators, with a few exceptions. But he was playing to the public gallery. His aim, as ever, was not to work within the system, but to work around it by any means necessary. Huey again, quote, God invited us all to come and eat and drink all we wanted. He smiled on our land and we grew crops of plenty to eat and wear. He showed us in the earth the iron and the other things to make everything we wanted. He unfolded to us the secrets of science so that our work might be easy. God called, come to my feast. And then what happened? Rockefeller, Morgan and their crowd stepped up and took enough for 120 million people and left only enough for 5 million for all the other 125 million to eat. And so many millions must go hungry, and without these good things God gave us, unless we call on them to put some of it back. End quote. Share our wealth reminds me a little of reading the Communist Manifesto for my research on the Stalin episodes. There's so much eloquence and emotional persuasiveness when denouncing the system and proposing a utopia than there is in the practical explanation of how we will transition between these states. Share our wealth, unlike communism, was an even less fleshed out theory. It did nothing to address corporate interests. What of the wealth and assets of private companies and shareholders? Share our wealth was distinguished from communism because it didn't propose to nationalise industry. But then, what do you do with it? Huey probably had a better economic understanding than the naivety of the policy really indicated, but the details didn't concern him. This was a time when people were looking for all sorts of solutions, like the radio priest Charles Coughlin, who we mentioned already, was saying that all of the economic woes would be cured by putting America back on the gold standard. Now, there's no reason to think that that's necessarily true, but people wanted to believe in a panacea to help them. As far as Huey's share our wealth might have gone, People might have mockingly referred to it as the Share Our Swag programme. But by the middle of 1934, Huey was receiving more mail than any other senator. Later on, as this increased, it got to the stage where he was getting more posts than the president, over 60,000 letters a week. A staff of 25 people worked around the clock to handle it all. He founded Share Our Wealth Societies throughout the country for people to meet and discuss the programme and agitate politically. Admittedly, these are broadly Huey's own figures, but he claimed that after a month, the Share Our Wealth Clubs had 200,000 members. After a year, they had 8 million. This was 20% of the population who had voted in the last general election. Share Our Wealth may have been a chimera with no real means of funding it and no hope of success, but that didn't mean it wasn't wildly popular, especially in the South, in Louisiana and the neighbouring states with similar populations, where Huey enjoyed his greatest support. Could Huey Long's travelling salesman charm, populist appeal, and willingness to win by any means necessary really sweep him into the White House? He was beginning to seem like less and less of a joke. And as people stopped laughing, they began working out how to seriously oppose him. In this perhaps is the greatest achievement of Huey Long's political career. He, and other populist would-be kings like Charles Coughlin, were important factors in the mind of FDR as he negotiated the New Deal. Roosevelt supported a Louisiana investigation into electoral fraud that brought plenty of embittered anti-Longites together. Even Earl, Huey's estranged brother, testified against him. Huey, struggling to take the betrayal, got up dramatically during Earl's testimony and yelled that he was lying. FDR is remembered warmly for his fireside chats, radio broadcasts where he explained his policies and the actions of the government to the people. Direct democracy, whereby he appealed to the people to support legislation by writing to their members of Congress. But these were similar tactics as Huey had used in Louisiana, and had begun to use on the national stage. Huey may not have been able to speak with the authority of the president, but via the public radio, he could and did reach as many people. We've already mentioned Charles Coughlin, whose 
initially religious broadcasts gradually degenerated into a sort of populist, anti-Semitic fascism. What's interesting about the 1930s is that we have a case study for a new medium, initially not well regulated, that gives plenty of voices a near equal platform that they haven't had before. People can choose to tune in to whatever sounds best to them. Sound familiar? The mainstream media and newspapers in Washington, and nationally, generally decried Huey as a populist, a radical, and a wannabe dictator. These allegations were not without their merits. We've seen the ways that Huey did subvert the democratic process in Louisiana. Even in 1933-4, he was being investigated for his use of dummy candidates, who allowed the Long Camp to have more electoral commissioners than they were due. These electoral commissioners often made sure that people voted the right way, if you see what I mean. The brazenness of this tactic came out in the investigation. When one of the dummy candidates was questioned, the lawyer questioning him asked why, if he was a genuine candidate, he had not chosen to do any campaigning at all, or even announcing his candidacy to the press. Given that he hadn't told anyone about the campaign, but needed their votes, was it therefore perhaps not likely to be successful? The dummy candidate struggled for a minute. How could he make it look like he was genuinely trying to win the office? But eventually he came up with a response. In a democracy, that's the risk you take. Huey loved all publicity, even negative publicity. Where once he'd railed against Standard Oil as his greedy symbol of corporate interest, trying to smear him through the lying newspapers, he could now just replace it with the big national banks of J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller on Wall Street. In August 1933, Huey's pet newspaper, the Louisiana Progress, got an upgrade in line with his new ambitions. It was now the American Progress. It was also around this time that he finally published his first autobiography, Every Man a King, which we drew on heavily for our discussions of his early life. It charts his rise to fame, political power and prominence, in a hilariously biased but also highly readable way. There's a really brilliant incident from around this time that I won't dwell on in too great a detail, but it's good to read about it. Essentially what happened, drunk one night, was that Huey got into some kind of altercation in a men's toilets and ended up with a black eye. Most unbiased accounts tend to assume it was a drunken scuffle over some minor urine-related slight, but the papers had a field day and gleefully printed all kinds of scurrilous rumours. Huey, meanwhile, claimed that it was a member of the House of Morgan, alluding to the bank, and offering his own wild conspiracy theory that a team of gangsters hired by the Wall Street was responsible. For the rest, I'll quote T. Harry Williams, writing, remember, in 1969. Quote, Huey need not have been bothered by the publicity or the campaign of the conservative newspapers to ridicule him into oblivion. Neither damaged him seriously, although they would have ruined an ordinary politician. Such a man would have issued solemn denials which would not have been believed. Huey chose exactly the right defence. He told a monumental falsehood. Hardly anyone believed that he'd been beaten up by gangsters sent by the Morgans but the story was so magnificently conceived and compelling that people laughed admiringly and overlooked his indiscretion. End quote. For future reference, if you're going to lie in politics, be sure to double down. In some ways, his willingness to say almost anything actually helped him in the Senate debates. One Democratic senator recalled, quote, Frankly, we were afraid of him. He is unscrupulous beyond belief. He might say anything about me something entirely untrue that could ruin me in my state. He will go to the limit. End quote. Even as Huey's popularity and notoriety grew, he still had to deal with rising political tensions back in Louisiana. One of the issues with establishing the kind of domination that Huey did over politics and government, but stopping short of throwing all your political enemies in jail like a Hitler or a Stalin, is that all those enemies are still there, looking for any opportunity in his absence to regain control of the state. In May of 1934, 500 armed men arrived in the state capital. Every one of them was fervently anti-Long. They'd been brought there by a league of anti-Longs who were planning a political coup. Note that this was not a military coup. The armed men were merely there to help keep the peace if things got ugly. But the distinction was beginning to blur. Although the anti-Longs believed that they might be able to vote to impeach and remove key officers in the Louisiana government, including Huey's sock puppet governor, O.K. Allen, they were mistaken. Huey rushed back to offer the appropriate bribes and remind the appropriate people of their place alongside him. 
Once again, the long machine proved too ruthlessly efficient, and Huey himself too personally organised and determined, for anyone to hope to combat it successfully. The anti-long pretenders were forced to return their armed men home without impeaching anybody. Huey used the temporary political victory, and his presence in Louisiana, to tighten his control, ramming new laws through. His favourite tactic was to attach them as amendments to bills that had been proposed by anti-longs, then order a quick vote. One of them established state-appointed electoral commissioners. No more need for dummy candidates. Huey could pick his own man. Now it could be done directly. The original bill had been designed to regulate dummy candidates. Other measures were essentially directly to punish the rebellious old regulars in New Orleans. Their liquor sales were taxed, and other sources of income for the city were stripped. The attempt to seize power was so flagrant that an anti-long legislator sarcastically offered an amendment, granting election officers the power to, quote, shoot and kill any person who cast their ballot against the desires of Senator Long, end quote. It wasn't passed, but maybe Huey thought he didn't need to pass it. All of these laws that pertain to elections were important, because there were congressional and judicial elections in Louisiana coming up in 1934. Specifically, there were a lot of local elections in New Orleans. Huey wanted to assert his dominance over the mayor, Walnsey, and the old regular machine that now backed the mayor and his anti-long bloc. Huey flexed his muscle. Fifty armed members of the National Guard in Louisiana occupied the voting registrar's office in New Orleans and poked machine guns out of the window. Walmsley, in response, ordered the local police and soldiers to defend the city hall. Soon 600 policemen were surrounding the National Guard, armed with machine guns and tear gas. Huey ordered that another 600 guardsmen were to be mobilised and held at a nearby barracks. As this dramatic armed standoff continued, the machinery of state politics was also whirring. Huey convened a special session of the legislature. The bills proposed were nothing more than a naked, unconstitutional power grab. The governor would be allowed to call on his militia at any time, for any reason, and no court could stop him. The governor could reprieve anyone of many different crimes, including contempt of court. The courts and local authorities were stripped of powers. Longites in the state legislature hurried the bills through in less than a day, with a minimum of debate, almost as fast as they could be read. In one of Huey's legislative flurries, an opponent asked Huey, When will we know what these bills are all about? The kingfish replied, Why, Tuesday, after they've passed. Most of them involved seizing greater control of some board or other for patronage purposes, or punishing Huey's enemies. Now the police, the firemen, the teachers, Huey had control over all of them. For a man so keen to share the wealth, it's interesting to note that Huey also appointed himself to act as a lawyer on behalf of some of the public agencies, a lucrative gig that earned him more than $150,000 in 1935. It's almost as if, with these measures that were so blatant and under such dramatic circumstances, Huey was daring his opponents to stop him. A more conservative, insidious Huey, maybe even the Huey of a few years ago, might have come to some sort of arrangement, let tensions die down, and sneakily increased his own power that way. But as far as the modern Huey was concerned, Louisiana was his, and anyone who wanted to stop him was welcome to try. The final straw for some conservatives, perhaps, was when he passed a tax on oil refineries. This was the same tax that had nearly caused him to be impeached as governor. Then, there had been 20 days of debate, and it had damn near brought his political career to an end. Now, it was done in ten minutes flat, with the legislature barely even realising what they were passing. He broadcast daily to the people. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Huey P. Long again, telling you how we're going to clear out this rotten bunch of grafters. The anti-longs attempted to fight fire with fire, rabble-rousing and stirring up popular resentments in the city with large public meetings. But it did not work. When the elections finally rolled around, Huey and his candidates resoundingly defeated the old regular tickets, performing well in almost all of the elections in New Orleans. The last political stronghold of the anti-long seemed to have fallen into Huey's grasp. By the end of 1934, he had thoroughly trounced most of the opposition in Louisiana, at least in elections. The major newspapers would also suffer Huey's wrath. He introduced the newspaper tax on advertising revenues to severely curtail their profits. He called it a tax on lying. Eventually, it was deemed to be unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court, but Huey had shown his willingness to use his powers to attack the media. The anti-longs that remained began to talk more openly about armed resistance to Huey as the only option. 
State politics did have some influence on goings on on the national stage. J. Edgar Hoover, who was running the FBI at this stage, ordered daily personal reports into Huey's actions, which were delivered directly to the White House. In 1934, Roosevelt got the IRS to investigate Huey and his associates for potential tax fraud. There were plenty of dodgy things going on, especially with the notorious win-or-lose oil company. Huey and his secretary, Alice Lee, owned plenty of the shares of the win-or-lose company, and it mysteriously bought and sold the rights to drill for oil in Louisiana. Eventually, in 1935, the investigation would confidently report that they had enough evidence to convict Huey Long of tax fraud and numerous other crimes, and bring an end to the reign of the kingfish. History would unfold in another direction, but they were already beginning to convict Huey's lesser associates in the long political machine, going after the little fish before the kingfish, and closing the net as if he were Al Capone or some other gangster. But alongside trying to smear Huey and take him down, FDR was forced to do something about his popular support too. FDR could not be outflanked from the left by a demagogue like Huey Long, and so Huey is probably responsible for moving the New Deal platform further to the left. The background appeal for Share Our Wealth must have been in FDR's mind when he established Social Security, which contains some, albeit watered-down, versions of the same proposals for old-age pensions and relief for the needy that Share Our Wealth had contained. FDR learned the lesson that the anti-long legislatures never did. It's not enough to simply be against a demagogue, to cry dictator, and to insist that this awful man should be thrown in jail. It was necessary to offer people an alternative platform, win the war of words in explaining why this platform is better and more realistic, and convince them that you, and not the demagogue, really have their best interests at heart. After all, it wasn't necessarily Huey's power grabs, but it was instead the loyalty of the people that really made him difficult to dislodge in Louisiana. Even when the anti-longs in Louisiana formed the Square Deal Association to oppose Huey, which went as far as occupying the public square in Baton Rouge, the state capital, Huey could beat them back by force. And why? Because the people of the state were still on his side. Of course, a lot of FDR's fears were politically motivated, and his desire to discredit Huey had a timeline attached. The presidential election of 1936 was just around the corner. Huey had alluded to the fact that he might run in the past, and he had rebelled against the Democratic Senate, almost from the beginning of his term as office. He was establishing his own separate brand and clear popular appeal through the Share Our Wealth programme. The reality of the political situation was that Huey didn't have anywhere near enough votes to win a race in 1936. But there is no doubt that he had a grand strategy. He entered into negotiations with Charles Coughlin, the noted radio priest and populist, who would later go on to endorse fascism. Both of them shared an underground appeal with the masses who were dissatisfied with the elites and the establishment. Between them, if they ran together, they might be able to eke out some 6 to 8 million votes, around the numbers of people in the Share Our Wealth Clubs, remember, and would surely carry some southern states along with them. They might also carry the swing vote in key northern states. Huey thought that, by splitting the progressive vote, he could ensure that FDR did not receive a second term the Republican candidate would then be elected, inevitably try to undo some of the New Deal reforms. Then the country would slip into further economic chaos and depression, and, with the failure of both viable alternatives, Huey himself could sweep to the presidency in 1940. This was not an idle fantasy. Stranger things have happened. The fact that Huey was not always clear about whether he himself would run, or whether he would endorse a populist candidate, is evidence that he might have been eyeing chaos and 1940 eagerly. And we've seen his astonishing political career together. Would you really put it past him to pull something like this off? He was already focusing on demonising FDR in speeches in the Senate. Quote, So it has been that while people have begged for meat and bread, Roosevelt's administration has sailed merrily along, ploughing under and destroying the things to eat and wear, with tear-dimmed eyes and hungry souls made to chant for this new deal. In retaliation, FDR ordered any federal employee who was a long supporter to be fired. Millions of dollars worth of federal aid were to be withheld from Louisiana on the grounds that Huey would use the money to strengthen his own political machine. Roosevelt even hired men to speak on national radio against Huey. One of them said that, quote, Hitler couldn't hold a candle to Huey in the art of the old Barnum Ballyhoo. 
Huey, who knew how to speak eloquently and in a reasoned tone of voice when he wanted to, used his response slot not to hurl insults and abuse back, but instead to carefully and patiently explain the failings of the New Deal and the Share Our Wealth plan that he hoped would replace it. There were no insults, no clownish anecdotes, and no flying off the handle. Just earnest, calm persuasion. Millions of people, expecting a show, tuned in, and heard not the ramblings of a crazy demagogue, but what sounded like a reasonable man, selling them political utopia. It was a brilliantly exercised piece of restraint, and a political disaster for Roosevelt. On April 1st, 1935, Huey's grinning face made the cover of Time magazine. He would destroy both political parties, abolish the Electoral College, maintain his power through universal suffrage, and I defy any son of a bitch to get me out in under four terms, he told a writer of the time. Huey continued to be a thorn in the side of the Roosevelt administration as he was gearing up to run. This was marked by increased use of the filibuster. He did it five times in 1935, much to the annoyance of the Senate floor as they were trying to pass Roosevelt's second New Deal. In June 1935, he filibustered the National Recovery Act, a bill that was particularly annoying to Huey because it would give him no patronage and let Roosevelt undermine him in Louisiana. He started on topic with an attack on the act, but then quickly derailed into calling Roosevelt a fascist and saying that, quote, the New Deal bird of prey is stealing and eating children, stripping flesh from their bones. Eventually, he just started rambling about anything that came into his mind. He talked about his favourite recipes, even quoted extensively from Victor Hugo, which is exactly what I'd do if I wanted to kill an awful lot of time speaking. Well, that will write a podcast. Reporters in the press gallery actually sent down requests telling Huey what to speak about next, including one about Frederick the Great. At 5.30am, babbling about the correct way to make coffee, Huey could hold on no longer and had to dash to the men's room. The senators quickly voted and passed the bill, and then presumably fell asleep. Huey's filibusters were not all funny, though. Key parts of the liberal Second New Deal legislation were being blocked. Your selfish desire to get publicity, said one senator, has ruined the hopes of millions of people. And Roosevelt, for his part, even began to talk about a wider distribution of wealth through taxation in his speeches. The rhetoric of socialism, the rhetoric of long. This is what he felt he had to use to survive. Huey was never short on confidence. Around this time, his second book was being written. He called it My First Days in the White House. It was a wild, fantastical, dime-store type book, as much filled with jokes and attacks on his political enemies as it was with genuine policy. What was political was even wilder. The bankers would be put in charge of redistributing the assets that they'd formerly controlled. All except J.P. Morgan, who was a bridge too far for Huey. FDR would still be involved in government. He wanted him in charge of the Navy. But the threat he posed was a much more serious one than the fantasy in his book. Huey was plotting to destroy Roosevelt in the election, and making plans to form his third party. He was even being offered huge campaign contributions from Wall Street special interests. They realised they could use him to undermine Roosevelt and secure a Republican government that would be more favourable to their interests. The money he used to buy more sound trucks and finance a national campaign, the first step on the road to the presidency. Just as he has told his astonished new wife at the age of 18, he had it all figured out. In September of 1935, Huey returned to Louisiana to deal with some local affairs. He called a special session of the legislature, passing some more bills to ruin anti-long areas of the state. It's amazing that he was still so involved in the local affairs of Louisiana, but such micromanagement was still necessary to ensure control. Huey's boundless energy never ceased. On September 8th, during a night session, he was trying to pass a bill that would deny a specific local judge, Judge Pavey, his re-election by changing the constituency boundaries for the election, you know, gerrymandering. The bill had just passed on the House floor, and Huey headed to the governor's office to grant an interview to a reporter friend, with his entourage, lackeys, and bodyguards trailing behind him. It was at this moment when a man stepped out from behind a pillar and started walking up to Huey. At first no one noticed him. In fact, no one noticed him until they saw the pistol in his hand. One of Huey's associates tried to bat the assailant's arm away, but not before he fired. Huey was hit in the torso and staggered away. 
Huey's bodyguards caught up with the situation and pumped the assassin full of bullets. He was later found to have no fewer than 30 bullet wounds. But it was too late. Huey staggered out of the building and was taken to a hospital by a friend who had flagged down a nearby car. Within a few hours, word had spread, and hundreds of people descended on the hospital to find out what had happened to their hero, to see it for themselves. The assassin was one Carl Weiss, a doctor. He had never met Huey long before, although he was the son-in-law of the judge that Huey was trying to depose at the time. When Huey, dying although he didn't know it yet, was told the name of the gunman, he was confused. Vice? What did he want to shoot me for? I don't know him. Conspiracy theories naturally swirled around this event. The anti Longcamp insisted that Huey had actually been killed by a bullet fired by his overzealous bodyguards when they were shooting Weiss. Many prolongs believe to this day that Weiss was hired by Long's political enemies, although they can provide no evidence that this was a planned assassination. One anti Long alluded to the fact that if they were going to do it, they'd do it with machine guns to make sure he was dead. Weiss was an idealistic young man, and the most likely explanation was that he believed Huey Long was setting himself up as a tyrant. In the highly polarised atmosphere of heightened political tensions, he might have feared that this man would one day become president, that his menace was growing too great. He had previously, amongst friends, wept over the political injustice in the state. More than one witness testified that he'd said he was going to kill Huey Long. His own brother commented that, quote, his broodings finally unbalanced his mind, and, thus unbalanced, he saw as a martyr to liberty the man who would assassinate Senator Long. A last-ditch attempt at surgery was not enough to save Huey, but it took him two days to die, drifting in and out of consciousness, occasionally talking lucidly, sometimes wildly. This, perhaps, is how a hurricane dies. Surrounded by his family, friends and political associates, a week after he turned 42 years old, and, in his mind, just five years from the presidency. Huey Long died. The rest, of course, is history. Although with this particular figure, it's always going to be alternative history as well. If he had lived, if he had run in 1936 or in 1940, if he had managed to swing the election in the way so many expected him to do, if he had just fulfilled that last item on his political to-do list, what on earth would have happened? What kind of man was he? His legacy loomed large over Louisiana politics. Indeed, many members of his family would go on to hold elected office, including his brother, Earl. I haven't spoken to anyone from Louisiana, although if by some miracle someone from there is listening, I'd love to know what you think of the man today. But this was just one state, although for a while it was the Kingfisher's state. How on earth do we assess his legacy on American politics? How on earth do we figure out what kind of a man he was? Huey says, quote, I shall have to admit I am a demagogue. In old Greek language, that meant acceptable to the majority. When I advocated free school books, when I advocated free bridges instead of toll bridges, when I advocated paved roads instead of dirt tracks, that was demagoguery. There are many kinds of demagogues those who deceive the people in the interests of the lords and masters of all creation, the Rockefellers and the Morgans. Some deceive the people in their own interest. I would say they are politicians who do not keep their promises. I kept every promise I made. End quote. T. Harry Williams, whose wonderful biography of Huey I drew on heavily for this series, even at 900 pages it doesn't feel overly long. Well, he's certainly biased towards Huey's point of view, and he really does everything he can to downplay his undemocratic and gangsterish tendencies. But even he is forced to admit, quote, He wanted to do good, but to accomplish that, he had to have power. So he took power, and then to do more good, seized still more power. And finally, the means and the end became so entwined in his mind that he could not distinguish between them, could not tell whether he wanted power as a method or for its own sake. He gave increasing attention to building his power structure, and as he built it, he did strange, ruthless, and cynical things. End quote. William sounds like a man trying to justify what he knows cannot be justified. He sounds like an apologist. That was written in 1969. If you Google Huey Long today, 
www.hueylong.com is a wonderful resource if you want an amazingly biased and unashamedly prolonged view of his life and career. I frequently did use it as a resource. It's got some great cartoons from the Louisiana Progress, Huey's paper. And one day I saw a tab called Perspectives. I'll quote from that. Who was Huey Long? It depends who you ask. In Depression-era Louisiana, opinions on Huey Long were distinctly divided between the haves and the have-nots. There was no middle ground when it came to Huey Long. People either loved him or hated him. The poor regarded Long as a champion of the common man and swept him into power by large majorities. The wealthy regarded Long as a dangerous menace and lampooned him in the media as a demagogue and a dictator. End quote. The website barely mentions any of the darker sides of Huey's rule. The anti-democracy, the corruption, the kidnapping, the fiscal problems with share our wealth, the strong arm tactics, etc. etc. Of course, we're not far enough removed from Long's own era for the political bias to really go away. Perhaps it never will. The issues that Long touches on in his career are fundamental issues for democracy's system of government. How do the wealthy elites in democracies reconcile themselves with populist leaders and maintain their control? How vulnerable are true democracies where everyone gets a vote to liars and masterful manipulators who proceed to sell them down the river? If someone lies and cheats their way into office, but wins by a clear majority, has democracy been subverted? Or is this just an inevitable, occasional consequence of a true democracy that we have to deal with, in the same way that aristocracies have to deal with the fact that every third king might be mad. We forget that, for centuries, in systems that are lauded as cornerstones of democracy, like ancient Greece and the Roman Republic, it was accepted that you could never allow the masses to vote. Only people with a stake in society, with property and with education, could be trusted not to fall for the lies and promises of any blustering, blundering dictator. I should also finally address the insinuations in my episodes on Long because I couldn't resist picking out examples of quotes and actions that reminded me of a certain US political figure. They're similar figures in the way we react to them. People who like them view the elites in the media as out of touch and won't hear a word said against their hero, regardless of allegations of political corruption, lying or political inconsistency. People who dislike them accuse them of trying to become dictators, manipulating their naive supporters, and exploiting populist policies and impossible promises to gain power and wealth. What I'm going to say on the subject is that Huey was a lot more eloquent, a lot funnier, and he actually did more to undermine big corporations on behalf of the little guy than Trump ever did. Also, although he exaggerated his poverty, he's so much closer to the working man's hero than the man who inherited millions that I wonder what on earth might have happened if a politician with the charisma and energy of Huey Long had come along in 2015. That's not to say his intentions were pure, or that he wouldn't have wrecked the country, or that he wasn't just as corrupt. But it's just a fact. And in some ways, Huey proved himself to be far worse than almost any comparable politician in US history. The corrupt machine he established, which siphoned the oil wealth of Louisiana into a few pockets, including his own, have left inequality and poverty in the state as bad as they were before his reign, despite his claims. The state still ranks 45th in terms of median household income. We cannot hold him responsible for the actions of those who came later. But I think we've seen enough times that, at best, Huey could see no distinction between his own self-interest and the interest of the people. And at worst, he didn't care about the distinction. But the question I always knew I'd have to end on is simply, Who was Huey Long? I've tried to show both sides, although with modern, idealistic sensibilities, and in light of that many popular socialist leaders in the time since Long have been shown up to be dictators, maybe there are times when I've judged him too harshly. On the other hand, it's possible I'm way too young and idealistic and haven't judged him harshly enough. Was he a man with some ideals who had to do ruthless things in order to maintain his position of power because of the political system in Louisiana that he was born into? Was he a corrupt and power-hungry demagogue who exploited the suffering and desperation of Depression-era people for personal gain? Did he start out idealistic and slip into dictatorial ways? Was his ultimate concern power for the people, or power for Huey P. Long? 
There are signs and arguments and counter-arguments and opinions and counter-opinions, then and since. So many it'll make your head spin. Maybe if he had fulfilled that final goal on his list and become president, we would know what he was really all about. Maybe that would just intensify the historical debate. The assassin's bullet that cut him down as men will never know. But the fascinating life he led and its dramatic end, and the recurrence of these polarising figures in politics, who resemble him in one way or another, have meant that we will likely never stop discussing him. I'll leave him then, a lesson for history and a debate for the ages, with his final ambiguous words, spoken as he lay dying in a hospital bed. You can hear them as those of a popular hero who never got this chance to overthrow an unfair and corrupt establishment. You can hear them as those of a would-be dictator whose ambitions were thwarted. You can hear them as those of a human being clinging to life, as we all cling to life. Dying, Huey said. God, please don't let me die. I have so much left to do. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. That's the end of our series on Huey P. Long. We'll be returning soon with another dictator. Until then, please tell your friends about the show if you've enjoyed it. Leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, etc. etc. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. Until then, be kind to each other. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zenadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A dot bandcamp.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. <laughs>